Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. It's hard to believe that we got one more Sunday in this entire year. As you think about where this year has brought us and where we're at right now, it's easy to focus on all the negative things that have happened in this time frame that we've been uh, in the last 10 or so months, nine months. But as we think about this time of year and the celebration of Jesus coming to this earth, there's so many things to be thankful for. And that's my prayer today is that we focus on those things as opposed to all the other stuff that would really try to tear us down and take us away from considering what um, God would have for us, especially in this season. A few announcements this morning. A reminder that there will be a church this evening, 6 p.m. Everyone is welcome for that. We encourage you to be here. Um, this upcoming week is going to be a little different, knowing that Christmas is on Friday. We will not have our Wednesday evening Bible study as normal. However, on Thursday evening, 7 p.m., we will be having our Christmas Eve service. Now, everybody is welcome for that service. And if you have any visitors that are in town, we welcome them to come with you as well. Or if you happen to have a neighbor right next door to you and you just want to go over there and say, hey, we're having a Christmas Eve service, we invite you to come. We encourage you to do that as well. Just big picture, the, the, the governor re lifted the restriction of amount of people that we can have in church this week. So we, we're not limited to a number of people. We still are limited to maintaining our social distancing and wearing masks. So if you do have some friends that you want to invite, feel free to do that for our Christmas Eve service. And keep it in mind that all the other restrictions that we're, we're adhering to through that. Next week, next Sunday, a week from today, is the last Sunday to make any contributions for 2020. So if you're wanting to contribute to church, um, next week would be the last time to be able to make those donations. And uh, a couple prayer requests that we have uh, a praise for uh, Sandy and Caleb Zervine, who was able to come home, or who was able to come home Saturday, that was yesterday. Is, is Nathaniel home now also? So They're hoping to discharge Monday for Nathaniel. They're hoping for Monday, so hopefully they'll all be home for Christmas, which would be a great thing. So praises for that. Continue to pray for them, though. And Marjorie Petrovich, those most people know who Marjorie is, um, would like the church to pray for her son Brad, who was exposed to COVID. And Marjorie is concerned because he's not a believer. And she would also ask to continue to keep her in prayer also for Marjorie. Um, finally, today's artwork has been provided by um, Michael Nelson. So any questions about his artwork, take a look at it. Ask him questions about it. I think it's pretty self-explanatory, but you may have some questions about it. So feel free to talk to him about that as well. So just a quick order of service for today. We're going to be uh, having our church uh, time of prayer here momentarily, followed by our worship time, singing some Christmas songs and carols. Then we will be dismissing the children for junior church as John comes up to bring us the message this morning. So with that, let's pause and let's have a prayer. <clears throat> Dear Lord, we thank you for bringing us here this morning. We pray that as we've come, we have so many distractions that can be taking us away from focusing upon your word, upon your spirit, and of, more importantly, how... You want to impact our lives. We pray, Father, that you would help us to remove those distractions, those things taking us away, and help us to focus on what your spirit has for us this morning, Lord. We pray that your spirit would speak to each of us, that you would um, plant upon our hearts and our minds areas of our lives where we need to bring them more in line with you and to honor you through that and to praise you through that. And as we live our lives, Father, that would be evident to those around us. Father, we want to lift up... Um, Marjorie Petrovich and her son Brad. We know um, Brad is not a believer. We know that, and as, as Marjorie has said, he's uh, contacted COVID. We just pray for him for his health, and more importantly, we pray for his spiritual health. We pray, too, for Marjorie, that you would help her to minister to him and be an encouragement to him, and just lift her up and encourage her through this time as well, Father. Lord, we're so thankful for uh, the Brumbelow uh, boys that are um, have gone through a lot this last little bit with their health concerns, and we uh, thank you that it seems like there's a light at the end of the tunnel, and hopefully, Lord, we continue to pray that they would all be able to get back home and try to get back to a normal style of life. But we, pray, we pray for them and pray for their health, and that we continue to improve, Lord, and we lift that up to you today as well. Father, we continue to pray for our country, for the leaders to be making wise decisions. We just lift them up to you this morning, 
We think of our missionaries too, Father, that um, probably during this time of year who would like to be home around other family and friends. Lord, we lift them up to you. We ask that you would encourage them, continue to give them um, an extra measure of your spirit to bring your message to those in the foreign lands and just uh, encourage them also in this time, Father, we lift them up to you. Lord, we now just want to focus our attentions towards you. We pray for John as he's going to bring the message to us here shortly also that that word would go out in strength and truth. And again, Lord, we just pray that it would penetrate into our hearts and minds to change us, to bring us into a closer walk with you. Lord, we love you. We commit this morning to you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Good morning. So I'll stand for this first song we're going to sing from the Apostolic Christian hymn. Well, hopefully you got your book because we're going to sing 258. So you sopranos, get on your toes, but it's pretty high for some of you. 258. From the beginning. From the beginning. That's the way it's in the book. Yeah, please have two different oh, okay. words.
77, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. <laughs> Thank you. 
sing the first two verses. I think that's my second favorite Christmas carol. Because it, it, it brings us back to where Jesus came from heaven in all his glory to be born to live a life that we live here on this earth. You know, I got a, um, I want to share with you a little something that happened to me last week when. I called my sister, my baby sister turned 62 last Sunday. So I was asking her on the phone, and I said, so how does it feel to have another birthday and then being 62? I said, you know, you're old enough for Social Security now. And she said, um, you know, John, she said, 
I'm a cancer survivor. So every birthday is a blessing. And I look forward to having many more. You know, and I had a birthday this week too, and I, I thought about that all week that, you know, sometimes we complain, we got aches and pains, and we can't do what we used to do, but we need to be thankful that we have one more. Because God has something for us to do. If we're still here, God has something for us to do. Today we're going to have uh, the fourth in the series on the Advent. The entitled the message is, My Eyes Have Seen Your Salvation. We're going to read out of Luke 2, 21 to 40. Our text today shows us that even after 400 years without revelation from God, there were still people who had expectation and hope for the coming Messiah. Today we'll look at two people who were waiting in expectation for the arrival of the Lord Jesus. Simeon's life was now complete when he said, Lord, now are you letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation. Let's read our text, starting at verse 21 in Luke chapter 2. And when eight days were completed for the circumcision of, God, of, child, of the child, his name was called Jesus. The name given by the angel when he was conceived in the womb. Now when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant, your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all people, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce you through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Now there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phineal, of the tribe of Asher. Asher, she was at great age, and she had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years, who did not depart from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. So when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom and grace. And the grace of God was upon him. <clears throat> Simeon. Those famous words that many of us have heard almost all of our lives. Now let uh, your servant depart in peace, for mine eyes have seen your salvation. Simeon is not one of the ones that you'll find on a Christmas card. Or, or in, at the manger scene. But he was one who was a man who lived after God's own heart. And a man who was looking for something in his life. Can you imagine the relationship he must have had for the Spirit to come to him and say, you're not going to die until you see Jesus, till the Messiah. 
And I'm thinking about people, you know, my age, when people get to be my age, we have bucket lists, things that we like to do in life, things that we like to see through. You know, my bucket list was my trip I made in 2018 when I was able to drive, drive um, almost 10,000 miles across the country and saw a lot of things. That was one of my bucket lists. Simeon's bucket list was he was going to be able to see Jesus. Think how exciting he must have been when the Spirit came to him and said, you're not going to die till you see the Lord's Messiah. As we look at our text today, we'll see that there were some things that had to be done because Jesus was born a Jew. There were some things that, that Mary and Joseph had to do for Jesus. The first one in verse 21, he was circumcised on the eighth day. And his name was given. The same name that the angel told them that they would name him, Jesus. And they were obedient to that. The second thing that happened here is the presentation in the temple. Joseph and Mary knew the law. They knew what was expected of them when they had this man-child. They knew he was supposed to be dedicated to the Lord. Verse 22 says, now in the days of her purification, when those 40 days were over, when she was allowed to go to the temple, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Verse 23, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens a womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what was said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And we know because it was two young pigeons that Mary and Joseph were poor. Because they couldn't afford a lamb. But God in his wisdom, when he set up this law, realized there were people who weren't going to be able to do that. The lamb, bring the lamb. And he made this provision that they could bring two turtle doves or two pigeons. Mary and Joseph were following the law by presenting their firstborn son in the temple. And they were only able to offer a pair of pigeons or two turtle doves because they were poor. They also understood something far more than that. They understood that every firstborn male was holy to the Lord. And they were dedicating him. We dedicate babies here in our church. Can you imagine what it must have been like for Mary and Joseph to bring Jesus, the Savior of the world, to the temple to be dedicated to the Lord's service? They understood what needed to happen in their lives. The scene shifts now as they came. Simeon was waiting, it says in, in uh, the text here, he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. As I checked on, uh, in Webster, Hans's uh, authority, consolation means comfort or solace. What did the people of Israel need comfort for and solace? They were living in difficult times. The Romans were in charge. The Romans were a cruel people. They were taxed really terribly. They were looking for something that would make their lives better. Simeon was waiting for comfort. He was also in tune with the Holy Spirit and the scriptures. He was devout, faithfully waiting for the promise. The 
consolation of Israel. The Roman rulers treated the Israelite people pretty bad. When we look at what Jesus said, when he was getting his disciples ready for the time that he was going to leave, and he wouldn't be there with them anymore to walk with them and to share time with them. He said in, in John 14, verse 16, and this is in the old King James, and I picked that because they use the word comfort. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. So when you look at that verse, you realize that Jesus called himself a comforter. He himself was, had come to comfort the Israelites. Simeon was waiting for that comfort. He was ready to obey the Holy Spirit. As I mentioned already, and I, I think this is really, really key when we think about this, that 400 years and nothing was written. There was no revelation from God. And yet, Simeon was in tune with God's word. He was in tune with the prophecies. And he knew that Jesus was on his way to come to Israel. His obedience... When the Spirit came to him and said, go to the temple, his obedience brought him face to face with the baby Jesus. I want you to imagine how he must have felt to see the culmination of everything he had hoped for in his life be right in front of him. And he reached down and he picked up the baby Jesus and he held him in his arms. And the joy that he must have felt when he looked into the eyes of the Savior of the world. His life was now complete. He had seen the Messiah. He had seen the Lord's salvation. Isaiah 25, 9 says, And it will be said in that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Imagine how he felt when he held the baby Jesus in his arms, and he knew the fruition, the word had come to fruition in his own life, and the, prophets, and the, the Holy Spirit's unction brought him face to face with Jesus. This should be exciting for us, too. Because everyone now could know the light that brings salvation to all people. And the, the word is, is explicit here where it says the Gentiles. That's us. That's us. Acts 2.21 says, And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And Titus 2.11 says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto all men. You see, Simeon understood. He understood that Jesus also came to bring revelation to the Gentiles. Last week we talked about light. He says in verse 32, in 31 and 32, you, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. He understood that. That those outside of his, his circle were too going to have the offer of salvation. We should be excited about that when we think about that. Because all these years, God chose Abraham to be the father of a great nation. 
And we know the ups and downs that they had. And we know that there were many people that watched all the things that happened to the Israelite people. And here, those very people who watched would be uh, exposed to the light of Jesus. Simeon also foretold what had to happen as Jesus, as Jesus fulfilled God's plan. Jesus would either be the rock of salvation or the rock of offense. Look what it says. And Joseph and his mother marveled at the things which were spoken of him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce your own soul also that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Mary was going to understand what Jesus was going to have to go through to bring light and salvation to the world. We can, we can turn the clock ahead some if you read in, in, this, in the scriptures that Mary was at the, the cross and he watched as Jesus was crucified and she watched as Jesus was crucified. So her soul was pierced in sadness but also in joy because Jesus had victory over death and allows us to have salvation through his name. Anna. She was waiting too. The scripture says that she spent all of her time, all of her waking moments in the temple serving. It says that she's 84 years old. A widow. A widow had only been married seven years. I don't know how old she was, if she was really 84 or she was older, but I know that if most of the time in, in those days a, a, a woman got, a girl got married as a teenager, and she possibly could have been a uh, widow since the time she was 21 or 22 years old. So if that's the case, we're talking about 60 some years, around 60 years, that she devoted herself to the temple in fasting and prayer. Night and day, it says. So what was she waiting for? She was there when she saw Simeon pick up Jesus. What did she have to say during this time? Verse 38. And coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. She was looking for forgiveness, for redemption, for her people. She had lived a long and a pure in a righteous life. She knew the world needed forgiveness that only Jesus could bring. Simeon and Anna were both waiting for Jesus, the Messiah, to come. Likewise, we need to bring this back to us today in 2020. We also are waiting for Jesus to come, to return. We have that promise in his word. That promise might not come to fruition in my life, but it might in your life. Because Jesus is destined to come back. 
and to set up his kingdom. Philippians 3.20 For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Christ Jesus. In Hebrews 9.28 So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many, to those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. He's coming back. He'll claim his bride then, his chosen people, those who, who followed him. And he will set up his earthly kingdom at that point. Now, I don't know if, it, if um, Simeon was expecting Jesus to set up an earthly kingdom when he came, when he saw him, when he held him in his arms and he looked at God's salvation. I don't know if he expected that to happen in his lifetime or, you know, soon after he saw Jesus. But we all know what happened. Jesus had to live a perfect life and be taken and, and crucified on a cruel cross and shed his blood, the blood that would, would cover the sins of the world, past, present, and future. Well, I don't know if Simeon understood that. But I do know that the, the biggest thing on his bucket list came to fruition in his life. As I think about the waiting, we're waiting today, too. We're waiting for Jesus to return. We're waiting for things to happen in this world that we wish we could change, but it's not happening. But we do know that God is in control. And we know that when the time is right, Jesus will come back to us. We set aside this time of year to celebrate his birth. We should also celebrate his life. We should also celebrate the fact that he was unashamed to stand up no matter what for his purpose. When I think about all the things he went through and I think about some of the things that, that I think are, are nuisances in my life, I have nothing to compare it to and nothing to complain about. And I think that's one of the things I, I learned when my, my sister told me that she's, she's happy every year for her birthday. Because she understood being a nurse and being around sick people all her life, she understood the gravity of her situation, and she knew that God gave her more time, and God gave her healing. As I think about Christmas, I think there's three ways, or I want to talk about three ways we can ex also experience God's comfort and forgiveness this Christmas. Number one, approach Christmas with wonder. With wonder. What does it say here that in verse 33? And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of Jesus. Christmas is a time of wonder. Sometimes I wonder why God loved us so much that he would send his son down from his throne in heaven to come to earth so we could live. Look back at how the Lord orchestrated the coming of his son. Years, years before, all the way back to Genesis, the first messianic prophecy that after Adam and Eve messed up and they were put out the garden, God already had a plan. Look at Mary and Joseph's reaction to Simeon's words in verse 33, and they marvel at those things. Think about what they've already been through, how they marveled through that. Are we in wonder of God during this time of year, or are we caught up in the busyness and the stress of the season? 
Is Christmas just a holiday? Or are we making it a holy day? Has Christmas become too familiar to stand in awe of the fact that Jesus left his home in heaven to enter earth as a human child born in a stable? The King of Kings came to be born in a stable because there was no room for him anywhere else. And God announced his birth by the light on side of the hillside in the heavenly chorus of angels to some poor shepherds. In order to put the wonder back in Christmas, put yourself in the place of one of the characters in a Christmas story. I'm also I'm always amazed at the wise men who came from so far because they saw a star. A saw a star that had been spoken about in Old, Old Testament scriptures. Not knowing what they were going to find. Not even knowing if Jesus was still going to be there. But they made that trip. And the wonder of it all when they saw the baby, Jesus, And the shepherds, when they came and they went back to their sheep and they glorified God for what he had allowed them to see that night in Bethlehem. Or how Simeon must have felt that day when the Spirit said, go to the temple. He's there. Jesus is there. put the wonder back in Christmas, we need to think about those things that God orchestrated so we could have life. The second thing we need to do is let the Holy Spirit move. In verse 27 it says, so he came by the Spirit, talking about Simeon, into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do with him, for him according to the custom of law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God. Both Simeon and Anna were in tune with the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit directed them to the temple, neither of them were, were still. They didn't stay where they were at, were at. They went to the temple. This is actually the reaction of everyone in the Christmas story. When they were prompted by the Spirit, they moved. Likewise, when we are prompted to do something, we must do it. It could mean a blessing to ourselves and others. Are we allowing the Holy Spirit to move us closer to Jesus this Christmas? Or are we allowing the things of the world to move us farther away? The whole world is intent on delivering gifts to people. I cannot tell you how many times a day I hear a FedEx truck or an Amazon truck or whatever it is that's delivering something that comes down my street. I can also tell you it stopped at my house a few times. As you get older, you're not excited about a Christmas, about the gifts, as you are about what Christmas really means. I remember back when I was a, a young lad in, in elementary school, and I remember my, I had my heart set on something that was I, I just had to have. For those of you who are younger than me, you both don't remember this. For those of you older might not remember it either because maybe your focus wasn't the same as mine. But I needed to have a Fanner 50. It was a, a pistol that shot caps. And you shot caps by hitting the hammer. 
And I had to have that hammer of Fender 50. I was excited about it when I opened the box. And you know what? My, my joy was short lived because it broke it for me in a couple days. But the gift that God gave us lasts. It doesn't break, it doesn't wear out, it doesn't go away. Jesus is always there. He told his disciples when he left, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. The third thing we need to do is praise Christ this Christmas. Verse 38, and coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. Anna gave thanks to God and spoke about the one she was looking forward to for forgiveness. That's what the world needed. That's what the world needs today. When we think of God's gift to the world, we can do nothing less than bring praise to Jesus. The Christ of Christmas, the reason for the season. Let's not let the busyness of Christmas rob us of the true reason we celebrate. Jesus brought comfort, forgiveness, salvation, and hope. What more do we need than that? Those four things, comfort, forgiveness, salvation, and hope. The day is coming when Jesus returns. And every eye shall see him if it's in our lifetime, we can say, like Simeon, my eyes have seen your salvation. I found a story that I want to read in closing. And I think I read this before years ago. I'll read it again this morning. Many years ago, there was a wealthy man who shared a passion for art collecting with his son. They had priceless works by Picasso and Van Gogh adorning the walls of their estate. As war engulfed the nation, the young man left to serve his country. Shortly afterwards, his father received a telegram that his son had died. Distraught and lonely, the old man faced the upcoming Christmas holidays with anguish and sadness. The joy of the season had vanished with the death of his son. On Christmas morning, a knock awakened him. As he opened the door, he was greeted by a soldier with a large package in his hand saying, I am a friend of your son. I was the one he was rescuing when he died. May I come in? I have something to show you. The soldier mentioned he was an artist and gave the old man the package, a portrait of the man's son. Though the world would never consider in a masterpiece, the painting featured the young man's face in striking detail. Overcome with emotion, the man hung the portrait over the fireplace, pushing aside millions of dollars worth of art. The painting of his son soon became his most prized possession, even more than those pieces of art the museums around the world clamored for. The following spring, the father died. The art world waited with anticipation for the upcoming auction. According to the will, all the art would be auctioned on Christmas Day, the day he had received his greatest gift, the portrait of his son. The day soon arrived and art collectors from around the world gathered to bid on some of the world's most spectacular paintings. The auction began with the painting of the man's son. The auctioneer asked for an opening bid, but the room was silent. Who will open a bidding? With a hundred dollars, no one spoke. Finally, someone said, who, cared about the, who cares about the painting? It's just a picture of his son. Let's move on to the good stuff. The auctioneer responded, no, we have to sell this one first. Now, who will take the son? Finally, a neighbor offered ten dollars. That's all I have. I knew the boy, and I'd like to have it. The auctioneer said, going once, going twice, gone. The gavel fell. The auctioneer looked at the room filled with people and announced that the auction was over. Everyone was stunned. Someone spoke up saying, what do you mean it's over? We didn't come here for a painting of someone's son. 
There are millions of dollars worth of art here. The auctioneer replied, it's very simple. According to the will, whoever takes the sum gets everything. Put things in perspective, doesn't it? The message is the same this Christmas. Because of the Father's love, whoever takes his son, Jesus Christ, gets everything. Will you worship him this Christmas? Will you take the son, the most valuable gift?
Let's all stand for a closing prayer. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful to be gathered here together uh, with believers and to be able to hear your word and to worship you with, with songs and with the sermon. God, we're so thankful for your word that's brought forth. We're, we're thankful for this Christmas season and um, for your birth and the life that you lived and um, your death on the cross and resurrection that gives us uh, new life and, and hope in you, God. We, we thank you so much for that. We're grateful for the ability to gather together as a church body and to worship you. And um, despite the challenges that we face this year, we're very grateful for this Christmas season, God. I just pray that you would uh, bless us today and be with us as we think about uh, your birth and uh, rejoice in this season. God, we give you all the praise and honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for coming today. Two quick reminders. Thursday evening, 7 p.m., Christmas Eve service here. And before that, tonight, all are welcome back at 6 p.m. for our church service tonight. Thank you all.